We're excited to bring to you another exciting evening of learning, knowledge, and empowerment with PHP. Um, tonight's presentation is part of our new PHP Connections California program. And through that, we aspire to become your go-to hub of information and resources on planning for adulthood for individuals with disabilities. Today, we have the esteemed Dr. Marcy Schwartz presenting Preparing for a Successful Transition uh, to College for Students with Disabilities. If your teenager is on track to graduate with a regular high school diploma, this talk is for both you and them. Topics to be covered include an overview of the application process, self-advocacy and college readiness, differences between high school and college, college disability student services, um, and the office that you would work through and what they do and what they don't provide. Um, and also things to consider in finding the right college fit for students. So now let me introduce Dr. Marcy Schwartz. She is the founder of Thrive College Counseling in Los Gatos, where she works with students with unique learning profiles. She guides students and under, in understanding the differences between high school and college and the college readiness skills needed for a successful transition to college. She is an adjunct clinical associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University School of Medicine. So welcome. Thanks for Thank being you. here today. It's great to be here. It's a great and very interesting topic for me. So I'm happy to talk with you all about it. So I'm gonna dive right in and say hello. It's my whole big hello slide. I really thought this was fun. Um, and if you do have any questions, I'm going to try to um, check in with Diana on um, how things are going in the chat throughout my talk so that you don't have to wait to the end if there's something that um, is relevant that would be helpful for us to go over. Okay, so just as far as an overview is concerned, um, we're going to go over building college readiness understanding how college is different from high school and the skills needed to navigate college, understanding the various aspects of the college environment and being prepared for the college application process. So we will dive right in with college readiness. And the first one that we're gonna go over is self-advocacy. And um, if you talk to most anybody who works in a disability services office at most any college and ask them what they would think is one of the most important skills that they feel students should have when starting college, they would probably say self-advocacy. And it's really the ability to articulate one's needs and make informed decisions, um, including about the, the support necessary to meet their needs. Um, so I have found in the work that I do that this ability for self-advocacy can vary by domain. So if I, um, I can work with a student who's great at asking for help academically, they're familiar with their teachers, they feel comfortable with them, maybe it's a student who's at a small school, and so their academic self-advocacy may be really awesome. But then it's also important to understand self-advocacy interpersonally and medically, you know, if a student doesn't feel well, will they advocate and say, I need some help or, um, or reach out to somebody um, in college, reaching out to a resident assistant is going to be a really important skill that we're going to want to make sure students are, are feeling comfortable to do. And that's more the interpersonal self-advocacy. So it's a really um, key piece to think about in this whole process. And with the self-advocacy and thinking about it, these are some questions to consider. So can the, can, can the student consistently and in a timely way identify when they need help? And that timely way is very important because that's where I've seen a lot of bumps for students that they understand that they may be struggling in a class or with an assignment and then wait until a day or two before something is due and ask for help then. And so oftentimes it's a scramble and oftentimes in high school, you can kind of work it out, right? Like you get extension, you contact the school and you know you can 
piece things together at the last minute. But in college, that's not always possible. And so having that sense of um, understanding when you need help and being able to ask in a timely way, both academically and other areas is, is important way to think about it. Um, and then does the student consistently demonstrate the ability to independently communicate their needs to the appropriate person? And this, is a, a, this can be a tricky skill for, for students to build. Um, you know, going into a disability services office where you may not know people and um, it might feel overwhelming and concerning and you're worried about disclosure and, and, you know, there's all of these things that make it really challenging for students who haven't had a chance to practice this. Um, and so when, the, when, that, when that becomes a barrier to be able to communicate, then um, the student often won't, understandably so, and then they don't end up getting their supports and resources that they could benefit from and actually probably know that they need to have but then don't have. And so practicing these kinds of skills at home before going off to college and feeling confident with those self-advocacy skills to a degree, you don't have to be perfect with them, but that building that trajectory of skill is really a wise way to spend um, time in preparing for college. Another area is social skills. So students will need to be able to manage their interactions with roommates, classmates, and professors. In their interactions, they should be able to communicate their needs and concerns to others while managing emotions. And this is tricky for most people going off to college, disability or otherwise. This is, it's challenging. It's a big, um, it's a big learning curve for students to be able to navigate roommates and social stuff and um, a professor might um, not be very friendly and how do you feel about approaching that person and do you get overwhelmed and, um, and, and knowing that's where also the self-advocacy piece comes in because if um, a social skill, you, you have to use your social skills in a, in a situation in college and um, you're feeling unsure about it, knowing that you have a person that you can go to to advocate and, and ask for help or role play or practice how to talk to that professor is really an amazing skill to have with the self-advocacy will then turn around and help build those social skills and that social con that the, con the confidence that students really should have as they grow through college. So questions to consider would be how comfortable is a student communicating with, with with familiar people, which is often, you know, seems to be seems to be fine for, for many of the students that I work with. But um, communicating with unfamiliar people is a very common um, barrier. There's the, you know, talk to the hand, like it takes a while to work up to that. And that is totally understandable, but nevertheless something to practice while at home before going off to college because you're gonna be surrounded by unfamiliar people. And with all of this, it's important to say that the idea in my mind is that I want to create um, a situation for students where they are as confident as they can be. You're never gonna be 100% confident, but if we know the skills that a student can, will need in college to really work with them, to build them as much as we can, so that they are you know, at a, at, at, a, at a place where they have opportunities to continue to grow while in college. Okay, so independent living skills. Those include chores, personal hygiene, self-care, and for students who take medication, that's managing those medications. And those things should be um, practiced at home, particularly with the refill of medication, um, and, and also navigating um, with new people around that. So if a student decides to go to college out of state, they have a different psychiatrist or, or whoever's providing the medication, establishing a relationship with that other person is yet another new relationship a, a student is gonna have to um, have and build. And, and so all of that, there's those layers on executing independent living skills. So they might be able to manage a skill at home, but as they transfer that into a different setting with a lot of unfamiliar people, 
um, or situations that could make it more challenging. So just being mindful of the different um, layers of the skills and how they all impact from one to the other. Um, personal hygiene, I have to say, is the most common challenge that I see with students of um, remembering to shower regularly and um, show up for meals. You know, they students may not recognize that they're hungry until it's 11 o'clock at night and the cafeteria is closed. And, um, and so those kinds of things are gonna be really important. So questions to consider for that are, can the student independently manage their internet use without adult oversight? Very common challenge. Um, the number of families that I work with where the family shuts down the internet at night is pretty high. Um, and it's something that is may be needed for the student, but then it's important to ease off of that and transition that to the student managing their internet access. Um, because as you can imagine in college, there's not gonna be a button that can switch off the internet. Um, and managing their sleep with their, um, their um, computer and phone usage. Would the student be okay if their parents were out of town for a weekend or a week? This is a question that I almost always ask families when I'm working with them to really have us all envision where are we at with the independent living skills, dorm ready skills, managing the student's ability to manage an environment where they're on their own. And so a good way to see that is if the parents are not at home and will the student manage their internet? Will they eat the meals? Will they show up for school? Will, do they wake up independently? Will they shower and all of those things? And so high school's the time to build those, those skills. And, and with that building of skills is building confidence. And one of the nice things about the work I do is that by the time Actually, in the coming months, when I start to meet with my, or soon, current seniors who are now figuring out where they're going to go to school, they're about to graduate, they, they, there's a confidence that has built up in them as they've worked on their independent living skills, they've gotten accepted to college, they're navigating the next step, and, and, and that confidence that builds in the student is just so awesome. And you can see their readiness to go off, but it's not, oh, it's often not without a lot of hard work um, to make that happen. And it's practicing these things at home. Um, another thing to be very mindful of based on my experience is um, considering how much parental scaffolding is, is actually in place. Because I think we as parents, we kind of just do things, you know, we just put the cereal bowl out for the kid because we don't want them to be late or we prompt them or we do these things that are out of love and care. But when we really step back and say, how independent is this student of completely managing their morning routine to get out to school? It's important for parents to be thinking, well, how much am I doing? How much did I prompt? What little things that I do that um, my child should be doing on their own that I'm not even aware of that I'm doing. And so sometimes it's, it's important for parents to reflect on that. And sometimes I'll have them keep a checklist like for a day, the number of times that they gave a prompt just so that we're aware of it and we know what we need to build. So that's, those are important things to consider when looking at the independent living skills. So there's that, um, that, that's that section of just a brief overview of some of the skills or areas to be thinking of in building that college readiness. I don't know if there's any questions, but since I'm moving into a little bit of a different topic, um, I'll ask Diana, but maybe. Yeah, um, actually talking about some of these skill sets, I think now's a good time to ask some of these. Um, so there's a question about um, uh, handling disappointing experiences and time management. Um, can you talk about kind of the, the skill sets required for a college bound student for those? For managing disappointments and like the, the skills. Well, mm -hmm. it's a tough thing for most teenagers to manage disappointments. Um, I know that I'm around that a lot is, you know, it's been a tough year, you know, with applications. So there is a certain amount of disappointment just in that area. 
I'm not sure if there's a particular type of disappointment that the person's asking about, but um, what I would say in general, though, is really strongly encouraging communication um, with the student to talk to peers, to talk to others, and that they're not alone. And that whatever disappointment a student is um, experiencing, I mean, I think we as adults probably have a sense that in most cases, other peers, other teams are, are experiencing similar things. And I really feel like it's so important for our teams to know that they're not alone and creating community. And so if there's ways for family to help create community, um, that's helpful. Not sure if that's answering the question, um, but we can maybe circle back at the end if that would be helpful. And then the time management, that is such a great, uh, did you want to say something, Diana? Oh, I was just going to say, um, I think we got a little feedback from some of the interpreters. So if you take just a little pause between sentences, <laughs> um, I think that would help them to keep up a little bit. Okay, so, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. For no, the no, it's fine. It's fine. We yeah, have a, a little not my style to on. talk slow, but we're going to make it work. <laughs> yeah, um, thanks. But the time management is really important. And so many students do not um, do great on that sense of time or how long something is going to take or remembering to do things or keeping track of things. And it is very common um, there. I know high schools will have um, resources within the high school to build that if it's on a 504 plan or an IEP. There's also um, executive functioning coaches that do a wonderful job with students. And there's also some groups that do that. So um, you can be with other peers that are working on that. And there's different resources in the community. Maybe Diane and I could try to get that um, to people. But there's also mm -hmm. books about it that um, I can get you the, the names of some books about really helping build those time management and executive functioning skills. A main thing that I have seen though that really helps is when the student acknowledges that they could benefit from that support. And when that openness happens for a student, um, it's so much easier for whether it's the family, the school or the community resources to step in and support students, particularly nowadays. I mean, 10 years ago, if I had to find an executive functioning coach to support a student, it would be hard to find. But now there's, there's really a nice number of people in, in many communities that offer that, which is really great for our families. Right, right. We've, we've heard um, feedback from families as well who have hired executive functioning coaches. Um, because it's hard for parents to act as a therapist in some of these types of capacities. That's right. Yeah. Right. Um, well, okay. Uh, should I press on with let this? Let me see or? if there was, okay. I think there was one more relating to kind of skills. Um, oh, uh, actually, in the next section, you're going to talk more about the college services and support. So I'm going right. to yeah. save some of that. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll save the, the next couple for later. Okay. Thank so you, I'll Marcy. Dive back in at a slower pace. Okay. So now we're going to talk to the, about the transition to college and things to be mindful of. So in general, and I'm going to go into more detail about this, but in high school, the focus is on the success of the student that the IEP, the 504, the whole situation legally is around the adults that are um, surrounding the student, the teachers, the parents, that um, their job is to, to come together to figure out what do we need to do to make this, the, what, this student successful in K through 12. And so that's what happens. That's what the IEP is. And and all that. And then a student has a structured day within to, you know, for which they can go from class to class and receive their resources. The laws change in college and the focus is no longer on the success of the student, not that they don't want the student to be successful, but the whole approach is very different. The approach is offering access. And so any college that receives federal funding is going to have a disability services office. And at that office, um, they will be able to offer 
accommodations, like extended time on tests. We could talk more about those later. But the theme of it is that the student will need to go to that disability services office, explain, and I'll talk about how that goes. But the idea is, is that the student has to self-advocate and then the disability services office will offer access to resources. And th that's a really big difference for a student. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of education that families receive. I mean, there's this, but there's, I mean, I feel like there should be so much more um, about this big change that's happening and that the, the role of the expectations of the student changes. Um, and also students in college that there's inconsistent schedules. You can have a class at 10, break, you have another class at three, and you need to be able to manage your time well in that kind of a setting. So that's a big difference. Another big difference is the um, there's not a lot of homework in, like there is in high school. And there are projects, but they're kind of different. And the expectations are different. The grading policy is different. So you can have a class where you have two opportunities to get a grade, a midterm and a final. And there may not be class participation. Every class is going to be different. So I know many of the students that I work with that they can maybe not do so great on a test, but they did great on some other project or they participated or they did extra credit or, and so their grade was fine, but that may not be the case in college. And it's important for students to know that. So accommodations in high schools, I was saying the focus is on the success of the student academically. And the school is responsible, as you many of you might know, for arranging the accommodations to making sure that the, you know, the teacher is going to be responsible for um, offering a note taker. Well, that's not going to happen in high school, but you know what I mean. So um, parents also have access to the records of the student and they can participate in the discussions around what accommodations are going to be provided. Um, in high school, teachers can modify a curriculum or an assignment. So a teacher can in high school say, okay, why don't you only answer every other math problem? You only have to answer, you know, read this other book, which is similar but different, but then, but that's okay. And that's making a modification. It's fine in high school, that is not done in college. So um, accommodations happen in college, but not modifications. So it's an equal playing field in that um, if a teacher is giving an assignment, that assignment goes for everybody. Um, another big difference in college is that in high school, you can get tutoring through the high school and part of an IEP or a 504. In college, it's not part of that. It's just for everybody. So and that's nice because you have, everybody has access to the tutoring. It's not something that you're going to get through a disability office. In college, as we were saying, it's about access. And so the student has the primary responsibility for arranging their accommodations. And what that's going to be like is that when a student decides where they're going to attend college, they need to submit typically their IEP or a 504 or if they have a neuropsych eval. They like it within three years. There's some laws that are changing right now about that. So it's a little, well, so it might change by the time this group, I assume you're all in high school, go to college. But um, you do need to submit some documentation that lets the college disability office know what type of academic accommodations or other accommodations the student has been receiving in high school. Um, and so once that is submitted, then the college looks it over and says, okay, based on what I see in this documentation, we're gonna offer um, early registration so that the student can have their first choice of classes and teachers for timing may be important for students that maybe an 8 a.m. class may be really detrimental to the education of a student so that student would get the priority for the 10 or 12 o'clock class. Um, so there's a, so those uh, extended time on tests is something, a note taker is another. So the student will receive a letter from the disability office without saying why, there's no diagnosis. It's just saying, Charlie's gonna get these things. And then the student 
will have that letter and needs to submit that to every professor every semester so that they all know where Charlie on the day we're having a test, he's taking a test in another room. So that's how it works. And you can see that the, the college is there to you know all do their part of it, but it really hinges on the student. And, and the student has definite roles of independence in making this happen. Um, parents do not have access to student records without the student's written consent. And there are some forms that's, that students can sign that will allow the parent to have access, but they actually have to make the effort and sign that. There's a FERPA waiver, HIPAA waiver, and there's other things that I could probably get you that information, Diana, if people are interested. As I mentioned earlier, professors are not required to modify the curriculum or to alter assignments or deadlines. And frankly, you know, most, you know, depending on the school, but if somebody has, a student is struggling because um, of a personal thing or something happens and they do need an extended deadline, you know, professors are human and they'll likely, you know, offer that, but it's not just, it, it's important for students to know that you can't do that on a regular basis. And also it's not always for in the student's best, best interest to do that, because then if you're handing in everything a week late, even if the professor's okay with that, you're a week behind everybody else um, towards the end. And so that ending is, is, is gonna be a hard ending. And, and you just kind of want to make sure that you're not um, taking one problem and creating another. Um, and so I mentioned about the tutoring and how it doesn't fall under disability services, but you could take advantage of the tutoring that's offered at your college or university. Okay, so that is the difference between high school and college. A little bit in a nutshell, there's, there's a lot to unpack there if we wanted to, but it's just an overview for that. Um, now, looking at the support, what I was mentioning was the compliance level when I was talking about the disability office and, and providing um, just the basics of, of, of support, um, extended of time on tests, note takers, things like that. There are, um, so the compliance level is they offer accommodations, kind of like what I was saying. It's not much else. You re recorded lectures is a, is a good one. Sometimes um, another accommodation would be that the student can have access to the PowerPoint before class to pre-learn. And definitely some of my students have benefited from that. And so they'll work with a tutor to pre-learn. And then when they show up for class, it's, it's easier to digest the information and the, the learning in the semester tends to go better. So those are um, compliance level supports. And then there's moderate. Most colleges have some degree of this. It's not an exact science. Um, and, it, and, and so and there, it, there is a range. Um, some things that this, that some moderate support colleges might offer are workshops and study skills and time management. They might have some academic coaches. One of the things that I really like that some of the colleges have are peer mentors. I feel like it's a great program for an upperclassman to really work with the student because that's socially they get to get connected and, um, and that's very helpful. They um, will often have one full-time um, employee that has some experience with as a learning specialist, which is great. Um, and so it's only one person. So there's a student can't expect to meet with that individual weekly, but it's nice to be around somebody who understands and can help you advocate and get other resources that can be helpful. Um, Students still must self-advocate to access those services. And usually in these types of things that there's no fee for the services that are moderate like this. I will say that when you're looking at colleges and trying to understand the level of support, one of the things you wanna look at in addition to what they say in particular programs they have is the number of staff that they have. Because I've visited colleges and, you know, there could be gigantic schools and they can have like five people in the disability services office. So you can just know based on the staffing 
that it's there's not going to be much offered for the student that those staff is really that staff is really just focusing their time and energy on just getting through the paperwork um, system technology different things like that and it's not going to be comprehensive or really individualized for that particular student um, comprehensive services um, there is a range there, you'll see that there's a staff that is larger, that it's um, that this is something that you would pay for. So it's 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 organized, it's very clear, you're gonna pay this fee, and this is what you're gonna get. And then there are um, oftentimes applications that you're gonna need to apply. So you need to be accepted to that university, and then you also need to apply and get accepted to that disability support program. And, um, and so it's very important to remember to get that second application in. And part of that is that you're gonna be meeting regular, regularly. They're gonna give you a schedule of when you're gonna be meeting with your learning specialist. You're gonna set out goals about what it is that you're gonna work on. But one of the most important things that I can say about this is that, um, Every, you might hear that, you know, University of Arizona, they have one of the best known programs. It's the SALT program, but, and it is really great, but it is not for everybody. And so it's very, very important to remember that if somebody says, oh, you know, University of Arizona, they have a great program. They do have a great program, but there is in no way meaning that that is a great program for this student or that student. It may be a great program for that other student and it is very specific in fit. Some of the comprehensive programs are very autism focused. They're gonna do social and um, community building and executive functioning and they're very you know, ASD focused there. And then you have others that are, they're dyslexia focused. They're gonna, it's writing, it's the first year, it's, and, and these, but they're both under the umbrella of comprehensive. And so just, I've seen families, they get overwhelmed thinking about all these programs, but it's really about understanding what each offers and for your particular student. So that's important. And that space can be limited on some of these. So just being aware. Some questions, Diana, or we're good? Yeah, there actually are a lot of questions. Um, some of them are quite specific, but um, I wanted to remind the audience that this talk is specifically geared for um, the students who are able to take regular classwork, who are planning to graduate from high school with a regular high school diploma and move on to a college environment and taking classes. And so this information is specifically tailored to that. There might be pieces that apply to people on conservatorships um, that you can take away from a lot of some pieces as well. Um, and, and maybe there are some schools better at working with those types of situations and others. Um, but, but Marcy's focus today is specifically for our earlier scenario. So um, yeah, so what about for complicated students with complicated medical situations? What have you seen for that where they might be enrolled full time, but they need to be in the hospital for a week at a time? Um, what, how does that fall into the support plan for a college? What can parents so expect? Every college is going to be different. And it will also that when I hear that, what I think about is location, <laughs> like where is that college and where is that hospital? And, you know, how what's I mean, is the student getting on a plane and flying home and then coming back or is it within the community? Because um, that there just seems like very different scenarios. Um, so this is a it's a very good question. And um, my answer is gonna to apply to other things that are similarly unique as well. So what I would suggest is that if you are creating a list of colleges um, for a student, the student's creating their list and they know that this is a thing, is probably gonna narrow it down based on some location pieces, but then I would absolutely contact the disability office even before applying and they're not gonna review your particular situation because they only review the documents after you've been accepted, but they will probably give you a pre-screening if they'll, they'll meet with you 
and they'll, you explain to them your situation, have they ever dealt with that before? What resources are there available? And really get a sense of your reception. So as a parent and, and you know the student, you wanna feel like, okay, they heard me, they understand my unique situation and they're gonna work with me to give me some answers. Um, and so I've been on some tours that I spend some time in the disability services office and I'm like, I don't, I'm not even a teenager and I don't feel comfortable in, you know, with the, with the reception I'm getting. And so I would find that school, maybe probably not on my list, but you want to look for those schools that have dealt with something similar before and can give you some information to guide you would be my thought on that. It's also similar with um, food allergies, significant and serious food allergies. And then the families will pre-screen, you know, they'll meet with the staff, talk to a dietitian, how much can you, how do you work with me and my particular thing? And if you get the answer you want, keep it on your list. If you don't, then you just should. So there's other things similar to that that you really need to kind of pre-vet. I hope that helps. Yeah, yeah, those are great examples. Thank you. And um, you know, earlier you mentioned accommodations, and so in some colleges, students need to request uh, one week ahead of time that and remind their professors that they have accommodations. Um, you know, do you know if there is does that sound, I guess the question is, uh, is that how colleges typically handle it to get constant reminders every time there's an accommodation that they need to have in place? Some reminders to the, the, the only thing that the teacher is going to need to know probably is if, you know, where's the student during a test, if they're taking a test in a quiet room. Um, other things like they professor might like if there's an agreement that they're going to offer a PowerPoint presentation that the slides beforehand for the pre learning, as I mentioned, which is not hugely common, but it, it does happen. Um, then we just need to make sure that the does the professor need to be reminded to get that. And so there are some times where where those reminders happen for the, but for the most part. The students are, are gonna be independent in navigating. It's assistive technology, it's a note taker, which has nothing to do with the professors through disability services. So there's, um, so, so you still need to show up for class. You still need to you know, do all of those other things that the professor would expect, um, except around test taking and that kind of piece might be different. Does that answer the question? I'm not sure. <laughs> I think so. Okay. They can always submit another question yes. if they if they like. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, so, what about one on one? Is one on one an accommodation that colleges will provide? One on one no. support, like a personal assistant or a helper in class? No, but it is controversial. So, I, the, generally speaking, this is not something that is is offered. The, the expectation is that the student will provide their own one-on-one, -on -one, like if, if students in a wheelchair and they need some sort of personal assistant. Um, so, so I know that there was a student that was not too long ago accepted to Stanford and they were not offering the personal assistant. It was a whole thing. And I think that maybe they are now. Um, but it's not automatic. And there's another college counselor that works with students who have more physical challenges. And she would probably be a really great resource for that, for somebody who needed a one-on-one -on -one for that. Um, so I would, you know, they, you guys can let me know if you want her name. And I'm happy to get that resource out for you because it's not something that the population of students that I work with will typically need. And if it's for behavior um, and not because of a physical disability, then that's oftentimes something I have not seen a one-on-one -on -one aid for that. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but I have not worked with that. Okay, great, thank you. And let's see. Um, and so have you worked with uh, individuals with conservatorships and in, uh, taking regular high school classes and in that situation? Do you yeah, have so, any? 
I, I definitely have worked with students that have had a conservatorship or it's been recommended in the process, you know, when they're in high school, but I have not, they've typically, um, so I'm an educational consultant and I work primarily with um, college students going off to four-year colleges or sometimes um, bridge programs, which I could tell you about. But there are other consultants who um, do more of a therapeutic bent. They have access and information regarding college level, but still programs that are have more services available. So that's not something I do, but I definitely have colleagues that do. And sometimes we overlap and, you know, they'll work with a student for a while and then they'll send them my way. So this is like my little box, but I definitely have resources that I can share with you if, if that would be of interest. Okay. That's great to know that there are specialists out there that, that help those families looking for that. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, Let's see. And then I know you still have more things to talk about, about uh, the college and right. selection. So yes. I think we'll go into that later. And then I need to translate one of these questions. So we'll ask that one later. Okay. Thanks, Mercy. Okay. So now we're going to get into factors to consider when you're thinking about this whole college thing. So um, one of the areas is environmental. So distance from home. Um, what I typically recommend is that students have a list of, of schools that are close to home, but then also a little bit farther from home as well, only because students grow and change and mature so much in their high school years and that we really want by the time they're a senior and receiving those acceptances, we want them to have options and and maybe it'll be that the student is should still stay close to home, then that's great. They'll have options there. But if, if there's a comfort level for going farther away from home, I really want students to have options and um, be able to think through what's best for, the, for them along with their family's input. So distance from home, but with options for most students. Um, urban versus suburban versus rural, those are um, important things to think about. Some students really want the rural um, kind of out there in the cornfields, which could be great. It's quiet and um, there's a lot to recommend it. It's typically smaller schools that are like that. But then the downside to be mindful of is resources within the community. There may not be a large community. So if it's a student who has, um, you know, a, a unique situation and they need a particular psychiatrist with, with particular training, it's not, it's going to be, that's going to be hard to match up. Um, and so being mindful of that balance between the location um, and, and access to resources and kind of thinking through that, which is often, you know, suburban team seems to work well for, for many. Weather is a big thing for students. Some love snow, some hate snow, and um, some don't care about snow. And same thing with the weather, forget about Florida or Arizona. And so where there's always a question that um, I ask the, the students, uh, many don't care, but you don't want um, a student really being miserable with the weather. Um, also being very mindful of, it happens every year that uh, families will put some schools on the list that are, um, they seem really interesting, but they are maybe primarily commuter campuses. And so for at least the population of students that I work with, we really want to encourage social and community and you know campus life. And if that community, if it's a more of a commuter school, it's just harder to get. So just being mindful of some of those more environmental pieces. The academics are really important because there may be a school that has all kinds of all kinds of boxes that it checks, but we go to college to learn and. Um, we want students to be able to feel like they and to have the majors and programs that are of interest to them. So many students, A, do not know what they want to study when they go off to college and B, they change their minds, it's very common and they change majors. And so you want to really be thoughtful of just in general, what are some areas? So if a student you know, thinks that they're going to be an English major, but they really love astronomy, but they can't see them being an astronomer, but they've never taken a class on that, like it wouldn't be bad to have a college that offers you know, some astronomy just to, you know, just to have that. So it's just nice to think about the, the majors and the programs that are available. 
And then the academic fit that, um, so getting, you know, you want a student to be able to be successful and, and is their academic profile going to be a fit for what is expected at that college? You want the student to be able to feel confident that they can handle the, the work at that particular college. And so that's an important thing to think about as well. Did something come up, Diana? Yeah, you know, um, another another comment or question about uh, the, a child's medical situation kind of in the context of that last slide, you know, I mean, I, those are really, you know, good considerations, but obviously if a family has special considerations that are unique to that child, certainly you, would you recommend adding more questions to that list? Oh yeah, this is just a general, the, you definitely, that's an excellent point because each family should be thinking about what is important to them and what do they hold most dear. Sometimes it's a religious thing and they want to be near a certain experience that way. And so that will limit the school. Sometimes it's um, medical and being near a city or a hospital or that type of a resource. So um, sometimes it's family members. Like I'll work with families and they'll say, Europe, we can get schools in Boston, Maryland, and Virginia because that's where we have family and that's it, and or California. And I'm like, okay, like that's my, and so we work within that. So it comes from many different reasons, um, but that, you know, it's pretty common. Like they, my child, if we're leaving the state must be in a near, within two hours of a family member. And so there it is. So yeah, you'll create as families your own list too. Right, right. And then if the child has um, specific disabilities, how would they go about adding um, like a learning disability and, and narrowing that, adding that into their factors to consideration? So for example, dyslexia or high functioning autism. So that is what we're going to say right now, which is the other factors to think about are um, the appropriateness of support available. And so the way that you'll research this is that if you were interested in Santa Clara University, for example, since it's right here, and um, you want to know the types of supports they have available you um, at, through the disability office, so what you're going to get there, you would go Santa Clara University Disability Services, you Google that, you're going to get the page, you click on it, and you have to spend a little bit of time navigating it to see what they offer. You know, many of the, um, I mean, I've done it so much that I kind of know where to go, but what I would suggest if this is, you know, your first time doing this is just call them and, and really ask them what types of sports they have available. Say my child has, it's actually, it's ideal if the student calls and says, cause you're practicing that self-advocacy, I have dyslexia, I am looking, you know, I'd like to find out what type of supports you have available. But even before you do that, I would have the parent and the student, and if there's any tutor or support person that helps that student with their disability, sit down and together come up with a list of things that that they feel you as a group feel that the student would benefit from. So you might come up with, we need tutoring twice a week. And then I would say, is it specialized tutoring by a learning specialist? Or is this like an upperclassman that could do this? And is it writing tutor? Is that where it's happening? Is it um, executive functioning support? And really thinking about what, what the student would benefit from and then asking, because when you ask the disability services, they're just gonna give you general answers. Oh, we provide access, we do this, that, you know, as you heard me talking, if it's just a compliance level um, college or disability service, then they're not gonna have much to say to you. But if you ask very pointed questions, are there learning specialists in your office that support students? If not, are there any in the community that other students with dyslexia have access. And so that's the line of questioning. So you're actually gonna get a meaningful answer as opposed to kind of just going in more open-ended. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, that's great. So that applies to um, all different scenarios of disabilities, 
Um, I've heard you mention a few times now, so if the parents didn't add into their notes to reach out to the student disabilities office at specific colleges and have that dialogue, um, see how that conversation goes. And if there are any clues to how easy it is to work with that, that school and that office or, and, and what's the vibe there. Right. Yeah. And that, um, and if you're able to visit, you know, making an appointment and, you know, if you're doing a college tour at Santa Clara, you could also schedule a tour of the disability services office and meet them and see what you think. And, and they're really going to want to hear from the students. So if a parent and student walk in and the parent starts talking, I've seen them like almost like give the parent the hand. They'll turn to the student and be like, so what is it that you're here for? Because they're, they know they're only doing it, I think out of the goodness of their heart because they know that that student is gonna be the one ultimately that's talking to them. They're trying to help them bridge that from high school to college thing. So just be aware that they're going to be encouraging it just because they know what students are going to need to do once they're there. So I hope that makes sense. Yeah, and one other question in this age of gender sensitivity and um, varied identities, um, who would you, what, what would you suggest to that family as far as how to probe into a school to see what the culture is and receptiveness is of that, of that school? Yeah, so, um, there's definitely opportunities to um, look up different clubs and resources that are available um, at that school. So if you looked up um, Santa Clara University LGBTQ friendliness or opportunities or clubs, and you're gonna see, and I know I've definitely worked with my students on that once they've, you know, they got accepted to ABC school. And then we kind of together would dove into each of them and really trying to get a sense of where is the student going to have the disability support that they want, but feel comfortable. There's housing options that you want to understand. There's student advocacy and supports that are more affinity group type things that the student get, can, can get connected with. So they learn how to navigate the campus in that way through the other students and you know, that, you know, we go back to like other factors that we have here, that would be one that you want to re research. How comfortable is the student going to be in that environment? And there is a range. I can tell you right now, there is a range. And so you will see that as you start to navigate it that, um, and then you can just weigh like, where do you, what do you, what do you need to have you feel comfortable? Because that's what's most important the students mm -hmm. comfortable, Absolutely. Com feeling comfortable. And what, in earlier tying back into um, gender issues and accommodations, I know that may not be specific to special needs, but do you know of accommodations that they make for, or special arrangements they make for gender identity um, concerned people? <laughs> So it's really up to the student to navigate that with the college. So um, every college is, is going to handle it differently and have different processes. I mean, and it's also really up to the student. So if you have a, a transgender student, you know, where do they feel comfortable living? Like, do they want their own room? Do they want a roommate? And, you know, what does that look like for them? And, and so there's, that's really important that the student has a sense about what they want and that they can talk to somebody to understand the pros and cons of the decisions. Cause it's really hard for our teens because they're going into an environment that they've never been in before. So we're asking them to make a decision based on this whole place that they've never been and the experience that they've never had. So I really encourage students to talk to a therapist, talk to somebody, um, just to help them think through, well, what do I want and, and what might it be like? And then go visit a campus and talk to the people in the affinity group and how do they navigate it? And, and that, that's, that's a really helpful way to, and again, I've mentioned it before about building confidence that the student can walk onto that campus feeling like, okay, I know about the affinity group for my, you know, for the gender piece. And I know about the disability office and I know that they have the major and I like the weather. And like, there's a confidence that builds in the student and it makes that transition easier. Okay, great. Thank you so much. 
Um, all right, uh, since we touched on the dorm issue, can we address another related sure. one or, or in general, those uh, kind of in the same ballpark of like, if you have specific dorm concerns, you should really have that conversation with the residence office at the college. Right. And sometimes it goes through disability. Sometimes it's a separate thing of housing. Like if you, um, your neuropsych eval says that because of your anxiety, you can have your own room, that's going to, you, you'll present that to the disability services office, and then they're going to help you navigate that. So that's going to vary. But there are schools that have some really interesting living learning communities. There's sober houses, there's quiet houses, there's, um, Get what they're like very like meditation yoga like connected houses that way there's women in stem houses there's like so you can match your interests or what you want um that that you know so some schools have that some schools don't so i've worked with families that they we really have targeted schools that have those living and learning communities because we knew that the student would really thrive to start their housing experience living with other women in STEM because that would be very connecting, make friends. And so that's what we did. And um, so there's there's a lot around housing to unpack, but each school is gonna be different. And not yeah. every school is gonna guarantee housing all four years. And so sometimes parents really want that and that's gonna be a different school than one that gives you housing for the first year. And most people live off campus after that, like very different, right? Mm -hmm. Right, right. Do you, in this day and age of more and more crowded schools, do you know of any schools that that guarantee or any policies that guarantee a single room if you apply a certain way? Or is there is there any information about that out there? I've never heard that anyone say they guarantee that. I've had mm -hmm. some fan, I've had some colleges say um, when I've toured them and they were through the disability office and saying, you know, don't ask because you're not going to get it because um, we have a limited number and they tend to go understandably so to the students with medical needs that are just, you know, it, it, but yet, but there are, but their student might really need that, um, that single room. And so, but you, but you're going in knowing. And so that school, if that's a big priority for you, don't put that school on your list because it's going to be a battle and you're not going to like it and you're probably not going to win. So just don't go to that school. Don't apply. Um, but that's that pre-vetting. Same thing with the disability services. What am I going to get? And, and so if housing is a thing, I would definitely work to understand what's available in general. They're not going to get to know you in particular because you're it's too much for them. They can't do that for everybody that inquires, but they'll generally answer your question. Right, right. Okay. And then just one little tidbit somebody was sharing in our Q&A. They said that um, there's a, a list of colleges that have specialized kids with challenges called Colleges That Care um, online. So I guess you could search for Colleges That Care and this parent shared there's a list there. Yeah, there's also, there's a book called it's the K&W book. I think that, I don't know if Princeton has a book that, um, so there are books that talk about um, and, and other resources that list the colleges with comprehensive supports or other things. You could do a Google search as well, but um, I, I don't use those books just because I find that information changes so much so quickly and I have found that when there's a staff turnover, I mean, I just dealt with this recently, this school I was so excited about, it was really loving. And I, I was terribly disappointed to learn that staffing changes and now it's not what we had thought it was. And it's very disappointing. And um, and so, and how is a book gonna correct, correct for that? And how fast is it gonna correct online? So it's good as an initial guide of saying, let me check out that school but then you're really going to need to to dig deep in and make sure if it's that it's the right fit. Right. Okay. Great. Thank you. So 
I think that's it for now. Awesome. So just keep in mind, we'll kind of talk about the appropriateness of the support available, just making sure that what this either the college has to offer or what's available in the community, which can be significant. And keep in mind that what a college can offer is often going to be limited except with these comprehensive programs. And that includes mental health. And, you know, counseling is oftentimes short term. So if this is a student who has had weekly therapy and wants to con continue weekly therapy, typically that's gonna happen in the community and not through the college. Um, same thing with like an executive functioning coach, unless you have your student or the student is gonna be in a comprehensive support program that you've applied to, you've been accepted for, and you know that they offer that, you might need to be able to find that in the community. And what's really nice is that there's more and more online, like virtual supports that are pretty robust. And so if you are in a school that doesn't offer what you're looking for, but the student feels comfortable accessing those supports online, that's a really wonderful option that's more recent, that 10 years ago would not have been a thing. So um, just thinking about how you can pull together the support that's a fit for that student. Obviously the financial fit for the family I will say that um, sometimes families are just like, oh, you know, the cost of private school is too much, so we're only going to apply to CSU, CSUs and UCs, which is totally understandable. You should do that, but but you, it really is in your benefit to understand what um, how merit aid works, depending on the on the college and the student's profile. There, um, it is really common for me to see students being offered acceptances and um, merit scholarships for um, that equal what it would be at a CSU or a UC. That, um, and, but the college is a better fit because it's probably smaller and um, that there'll be more opportunities to interact with a professor and different learning environment that could be a fit. So. Um, colleges will talk with you about the finances if you connect with their financial aid office, and sometimes they will pre preview some of your document and give you a sense. So before you just, without diving in, just make assumptions about the finances, it's, it would probably be helpful to look into it a little bit. Um, a big thing I'd like to stress is internship and other opportunities, uh, career services that's available in college is a big thing to look for because one of the things that I tell most of the families that I work with, not all the families, is that, you know, it's very understandable for students with disabilities who've worked so hard to get through and to get into college and then graduate college that when they graduate college, they're like, okay, I've done it. And they, there's this victory, which is very well deserved. But if the student has just completely focused on just getting through, but have not also built work skills, you know, uh, internships and developed, uh, uh, you know, an understanding about what it's like to work in a job and feel comfortable with that, it's really hard to first start to build those skills when the school is done. It's much easier to get those experiences for internships or research or other opportunities of working in that way while in college. And colleges know that and they work with students, but students are going to have to self-advocate and encourage, you know, and, and, and work with their own professors that see if they can find opportunities. There are some schools that just have the co-ops built in which is a great opportunity for some students. So you can even Google colleges with co-op programs and learn about some that way, but there, those do exist and those are a great opportunity. Um, campus culture, some of some schools are very competitive. They the, you know, may be competitive to get in, but then the environment there is competitive. The students are just you know, vying for different things and other schools are, more cooperative and um, more relaxed. And, you know, sometimes students do well in that high pressure environment. And sometimes that is a really bad environment. So really think about the fit for the student. Okay, 
So if you're thinking about your situation and want to be open about, well, maybe we're, we're trying to be ready for college, but not sure that that's going to happen. Um, here's some things to, to think about. Um, one of them is that it's, it's probably a nice idea to consider continuing the application process and um, applying, getting your acceptances, choosing a school, and then deferring. So this way, you know where you're going to go and you can give yourself a year. You defer for a year and you can take a gap year to then really think about the skills you want to build. Um, many of the CSUs or UCs, I don't know if it's changed recently, don't do deferrals. So if that's those are the only schools that are on your list, this plan is not going to be great, but most of the private schools will do that. You have to give them a they don't guarantee that you're going to be able, that they will give you a deferral, but um, it's something you can inquire about. And then when the student says, I'd like to take a gap year, I highly encourage a discussion about any skills that a student could continue to build, like time management we mentioned earlier, or um, you know, building some academic confidence or whatever it is. The self-advocacy could be a skill that the student could build. And you, you want to take those gaps in what the student doesn't feel ready to go yet to go to college and, and focus those uh, your gap year on building those skills. Um, there are different gap years where you could do internships. There are gap years where you could take classes um, with coaches and really help you practice learning in that year. So, so really be very thoughtful in how you spend that gap year. I work with a lot of families where, you know, I kind of get them afterwards that, you know, they um, just felt it was an issue of maturity. And so we, they just took a general gap year they traveled in Spain or did this and that. And isn't that great? And they had a great experience. They did mature, but it may not have built up self-advocacy skills in the way that was needed for college, or it may not have built to the time management because they were not in school. So just be mindful of if you are taking a gap year, why and what skills do you want to build and then try to build your gap year around that. Um, so I kind of said that, there we go. Okay, so application process. So, um, so thinking about the students, um, the college readiness skills and other aspects um, that you're going to um, want in your college list. So if it's a student that is, is struggling to some degree with the college readiness skills and you're feeling like um, or more academic readiness skills, then it's going to be important to um, target your list around schools that are going to be able to offer that. One of the things to be mindful of that even with comprehensive programs, there's still an expectation of dorm readiness. So none of the campus-based, most of the campus-based um, comprehensive programs are not going to do that much with dorm readiness. They're not going to, you know, students still needs to wake up on their own, show up for meals, do some shower manage their internet. So those are things that, to me, those are dorm ready things. And, um, and those are things, they're, they're bridge programs that um, you could go to that are off the campus um, of a college and you can still go to college, but they're not those comprehensive programs. Those are other bridge programs. Um, and so thinking about where the student is in the readiness, dorm readiness, academic readiness, you know, looking for the self-help, um, things like that. Um, focusing, the main thing to think about while in high school is just doing the best you can with grades and doing your best rigor that is not too much for you or too little. I'm trying to find that sweet spot. Participate in activities that are of interest to you because, um, you want to follow your heart and do what you have a passion for because that's going to come across in the application. And so if you're going to be, if you're just trying to join clubs because you want to join clubs just to have on your college list, but there's not a lot of meaning for you, that's going to come across. It's just going to be listed as an activity 
but there's not going to be an essay about it. There's not going to be that energy around it. But when students participate in things that they, have, they care about, there's an energy that comes across in the application that that is what you want to shoot for. Um, you could take the SAT or ACT if it makes sense, if, it's, um, if testing is not your thing. Um, you can for sure not take it. If it, I'd rather you spend your time on a club or working on your academics than taking an SAT or ACT where um, it's really going to cause anxiety. It's going to be a big struggle for you and you may not be a good test taker anyway. Like I was not a good test taker. So um, you will, there will be some schools that are going to be off of your list because of that, but there are going to be many schools that are still going to be on your list, not to mention the CSUs and UCs. I heard that MIT is now bringing back their test requirements. So I think that that's going to start to happen in the coming years. But I and my colleagues really feel like there's still going to be a large number of schools that are going to remain test optional. Um, when you're thinking about the applications, there's going to be multiple applications. The UCs have one application. The CSUs have another application. CSUs have no essays, UCs have four 350 word personal insight questions. Um, the Common App has one 650 word essay. The Coalition App is a similar one, but it has its own separate essay. And institutional applications are colleges that they only have, that they have their application. So they're not affiliated with any group application. You just go onto their website and fill it out. So. Sometimes, depending on a student's list, you could be filling out multiple applications and you just want to be aware of that managing your time. Same thing with essays that can overwhelm students. So I definitely suggest that they get started over the summer. They're very doable, but they're, um, they're, they're a different type of essay than students are used to writing. So it takes some time for them to get into the vibe of it. But once they do, and now they're writing more supplemental essays, they kind of get it and they know how to do that, but it's this, there's a learning curve with it. So let's not underestimate that. And um, I really try to encourage students to work with tutors so that they don't feel overwhelmed. So it's, they can feel like they've got this. And that's my goal in working with the students is that the student feels well supported, that if they need something, they were able to, to put those resources in for the student. Um, so this does not have to be a stressful and anxiety provoking experience. It is, but we try to make it less. Um, thinking about letters of recommendations, you could start thinking about that now, who you want to ask. Um, you can talk to your high school counselor about that. Um, speaking of your high school counselor, it is very important for you to be responsive to their emails. So if the student is not good at checking emails, this is something to work on as far as an independent living skill because the high school, most high schools are sending are going to be sending out, you know, in the coming months, information for the students around this process. And you're going to, and there's going to be some forms to fill out for the student to fill out, for the um, parents to fill out, but it's going to be really important that the students are responsive to what their high school counselor needs from them. It's a hard job that they have. They're managing a lot of students and you really want to, they have a system and you want to be rocking along with their system. And you also want to try to attend college fairs. Um, if they're regional college fairs, typically they're, um, the college representative that's going to be at the college fair is one of the people reading your applications. Application. So it's really a good thing to Introduce yourself, ask some questions. You can always email your local representative. You can Google like um, Tulane admission representative, Santa Clara County, and you're gonna get the name of somebody and then you can email that person. And that is one of the, one of probably a few people who will be reading your application. So um, that's called demonstrated interest. And it's um, something to be aware of as some colleges, but not all colleges will care about that. Um, and um, interviews is, is another thing to think about as well, if some of the smaller colleges might want that. Okay, I think we're like almost out of time. How are we doing? Yeah, I, we addressed so many questions, only a handful left right at this point. 
Um, and so I think, you know, it's great you have this slide up because there are some people asking, how can they find a counselor? Do you have suggestions of finding um, a counselor and finding the right fit? So um, you can reach out to me and I can try to, I'll talk with you and we can, I can refer you, but there's an organization called IECA, Independent Educational Consultant Association, and then you can search there. I'm a member of it, but they only list professionals and I have not filled out that paperwork. So you're not going to find me on there, but um, there's plenty of counselors that you can um, look for. And then there's also an LDND designation that you can search for. So you can try to find a counselor that has experience working with students with learning differences. And that's a great resource. You can also ask um, if you have friends, neighbors, you know, different people who um, have worked with counselors that um, you can check out with them. And sometimes um, people who, who more do typical um, and not special needs work, they might have some resources to share with you as well. But you can always reach out to me and I can try to connect you. Great. And I know you guys are on a cyclical calendar because of the application periods and, and the academic calendar in general. So when would you suggest looking into and trying to secure um, a, an, a counselor? So I would definitely say junior year is the time. Um, yeah, so sometimes I'll start to work with families with a freshman or a sophomore in high school, but we don't meet very often. And oftentimes it's because the student is anxious and when they just need to hear some, like, we've got this, this is the process. They just need to hear an overview. I've got you, you now just go about, just do your best in school. And then they kind of settle and it's fine. Um, so I'll definitely meet with families um, younger, but junior year is where the, um, where the doing starts happening. So right now with my current juniors, we're really looking at, we're trying to work hard on our list. I'm reviewing, I'm making recommendations for them, giving them research opportunities or information to how to research colleges, going over the overall expectations of the application process and other counselors are doing the same thing. So this is now we're starting to pick up steam of with our juniors and our seniors are figuring out where they're going to go. So it's both classes right now. Okay, uh, great. And I put Marcy's email address into the chat so you can click on the little three dots next to that and just copy it. Um, and we do have a poll to launch. So Nicole, maybe you can launch the poll while we go through the last couple of questions. Um, let's see. Stop and then, sharing. Yeah, so we have, okay, there's the poll. Um, so thank you for filling that out. It really helps us to stay funded and to offer more quality programs and having great speakers such as Marcy um, on our team. So thank you for filling this out and it's in um, multiple languages. So pick the languages that apply to you. And this recording uh, presentation is being recorded. If you subscribe to our PHP newsletter, you'll get a see in the email when there's a new item uploaded to our e-learning on our website. So please subscribe to that and you'll get all the latest updates on all of our um, e-learning updates and recordings. Okay, and then so question about Landmark College. Um, if a child goes to a school that specializes in LD like Landmark College, would a lot of the issues you raise uh, that you raise not be an issue because the school helps the student advocate for what they need? So the student is still going to need to um, need to advocate because um, they're not going to. It's not like living in at home, right? There's there's not eyes on them all the time. So, um, but the one of the and, and they still need to be dorm ready. But one of the wonderful things about Landmark is that the teaching is really going to be attuned to the student. And so because of that, um, the student, there's often less of a need to advocate academically, right? Because they're with teachers who are able to pick up on it and work with the student. But the student still is going to need to follow through. So if the teacher says, okay, I've helped you with this, but I still need you to do X, Y, and Z, 
you're still going to need to go and be able to do that independently. So it is a wonderful environment, but there's it, there's still you're still going away from home, living in a college setting, and some of the things are going to be um, still important to build that we talked about. All right, great. And then, how do I find that find colleges that focus more on hands-on projects instead of academic written assignments? So there's always going to be that freshman English class that every college is gonna have. So setting that aside, um, there are some colleges that are gonna be more um, project-based, there's WPI, but it depends that if there's, if you wanna be an English major and be project-based, that's gonna be tricky. If you're STEM and you wanna be project-based, that's easier. And so the major is gonna have an impact as well. Um, there's project-based and then there's the co-ops that I had mentioned. So some co-op schools are um, Northeastern, um, Drexel, University of Cincinnati. Um, so um, those are the Rochester Institute of Technology is, a, is another one. And some of those schools that I just mentioned, they all have, not all of them, but some of them have some support, some comprehensive support programs, which is really nice. So, um, so those are, are ones that, that have more hands-on internships and, and those active learning experiences. But then there's other smaller schools like Drew University is a small school in New Jersey, and they do a great job of mentoring students with the professors. College of Worcester is another one like that really, um, really works with the students individually to, to get them experiences. So, so they're out there. Um, if there's just a um, question of like pulling it all together. Right. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, let's see. So those are great questions, everyone. I think we have addressed pretty much all of them. Um, there's just one that's very specific to you, Marcy. Somebody's asking, have you ever worked with students with brain injury? Um, to some degree, I have, but I, I don't, it, it, it's a broad thing. And um, so you could feel free to reach out to me and we can set up a brief phone call and you can tell me specifically. Um, so, so I can hear what your situation is and then I can refer you if it's not me. Okay. All right, great. I think that's a wrap then. I think we've addressed all the questions. Um, Marcy, that was so much great information. I really appreciate you coming and, and um, sharing that with our families. Um, if anybody needs Marcy's contact information, again, it's right there on the screen. Um, check back on our PHP website for more Connections California uh, events. Uh, we will be offering these types of events uh, around planning for adulthood for all types of disabilities um, and individuals reaching those ages. So check our website, subscribe to our newsletter, um, and again, people are asking how can you get a copy of our recording and again, subscribe to our PHP newsletter at our php.com website. You can click subscribe and then um, you'll get regular emails and be notified when we have something new posted in our e-learning.